Thank you, and uh, I really appreciate being invited here today. This is, uh, this is gorgeous, uh, and uh, if it was like this every day, I'd be ready to come here right, right now. So um, at UCLA, I uh, work on a variety of topics related to transportation finance, uh, related to issues around big data and privacy, uh, the performance of transit systems. Uh, but right now, we're, we're deep in the second phase of a work on uh, millennials and travel behavior, and so I thought I'd talk to you about uh, that work today. So one of the questions that has been uh, in the media for the last couple of years is the question of well, what's happening to, uh, to teen drivers. Uh, we have seen a remarkable decline in vehicle travel among people uh, driving age, 16 to 26. Uh, and there are a, a lot of stories being told in the media about what, what is happening. Uh, we have why young Americans are driving so much less than their parents, transportation of the new generation, the real reason kids are driving less, the cheapest generation, are Americans driving less between their work, because they're working less. A lot of theories have been bandied about. And <clears throat> so uh, with some colleagues at UCLA and some funding from both the University of California Transportation Center and uh, the Federal Highway Administration, we have embarked on a study of this. Now, uh, one of the things, I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but there was sort of a relentless climb in vehicle travel uh, throughout the 20th century. Uh, it, it seemed to be always on an upward curve. It might, the rate might slow during a deep recession, but up, up, up with population and, and vehicle access. But that, in, in the middle part of the last decade, uh, seemed to reach its apex, and uh, the curve actually turned down. And while it's been up and down since then, we've seen the first big change in vehicle travel in, in, in decades. And uh, the changes among teens and young adults has been particularly pronounced. In other words, a, a larger share of that decline in travel has been attributable to young people than to older drivers. And that's what's prompted a lot of the discussion about this. And it raises a question about wh whether we're headed into a new, greener era where young adults are increasingly dependent on mobile devices uh, that they hold and not mobile devices that they ride in. Um, and will they be less dependent on cars? And we're trying to kind of unearth what might be behind that. So the implications for the future of transportation planning are enormous, because if we have assumptions about vehicle access and use based on historical data, and we're now in a new era, we have to recalibrate these sorts of things to understand uh, what's going on. And we also need to understand what the drivers of these changes are so we can, uh, we can have a better sense of what might be on going on with, with older drivers. Now, one of the things that I tell my students about transportation is that it's a complicated thing. If you go into a major transportation conference, you will not get people to agree on whether more travel is a good thing or a bad thing. Now, what other field do you find that the basic output of measurement, there's no agreement on whether the arrow is up or down is a good thing? And, and in fact, OK, energy, that's good. All right, so uh, uh, this raises a real serious question because travel enables uh, social interactions. It enables uh, economic transactions. It enables people to thrive and economies to grow. But it also produces enormous externalities, consumption of energy, uh, pollution. Uh, create, uh, generation of greenhouse gases, uh, consumption of space. So we have this, this kind of tortured sense of what it is that we're trying to do. And most of us would agree what we want to do is reduce those externalities of travel, enable people to continue to participate in activities, but in a way that has a much smaller environmental footprint. So if people are able to thrive and travel less, we've accomplished a great thing. If they're traveling less because uh, people travel much less in Mozambique or Somalia or Afghanistan, that may not be such a good thing. And the challenge is to try and sort that out. So there's also a burgeoning literature on children's travel uh, related to active transportation, safe routes to school program, and just some colleagues that I know well and, and have been working on this, Marlon Burnett, now at USC, Susan Handy at UC Davis, uh, Noreen McDonald at my former home at the University of North Carolina. Uh, they all uh, have been doing a lot of work, but their focus has been on younger children, primarily. Um, 
And there's been less work on travel by teens and young adults. And they tend to be forming ha households and transitioning into the labor market. Now, as soon as we got into this, we realized there are enormous analytical challenges to, to studying teens and young adults because they're in huge transitions in their lives. They're moving from being primarily dependent uh, on parents and in a household for mobility to becoming gradually more autonomous and then going out on their own. And they're also at stages where they're building a lot of human capital. They're doing a lot of preparatory work for life. And so we don't know if the patterns we see early in, say, one's 20s will then play out over a longer period of time. And this is something else that we look at. So those are the nominal reasons for the study. And then you can ask the question, well, what's the actual reason? And the actual reason is that I have two teenage daughters. Okay. Uh, Nine, at the time, 19-year-old Risa was a freshman at Oberlin College in Ohio. And uh, she did not drive, uh, which I found uh, admirable and perplexing. She walked, she rode transit a lot. Uh, contrary to images, in West LA we have excellent transit service. Uh, she bum rides frequently uh, from friends. And when I'd ask her about it, I'd say, are you making this, are you making an important commitment to being car free? She'd say, well, I just, I haven't had time to get a license. I'll get around to it. I got, I got other things to do. It was just not very high on her list. Her grandparents had given her their 2002 Honda Accord when she was 16. And it sat cramming our garage unused for three years. This, to someone of my generation, is beyond inconceivable. Uh, so th this, this, uh, she was presented with her own autonomous mobility. Um, on the other hand, 15 and a half year old Maya, at the time, was a high school sophomore. She was eligible to get her, her learner's permit on January 1st, as she's born on July 1st, and was crestfallen to learn that the DMV was closed on January 1st. She told me this is completely unfair. And so, who I have to drag out of bed to go to school, had me up at 7 a.m. on the Wednesday morning of the 2nd so that I could drive her to the DMV and she could fog the glass waiting for it to open so that she could get her permit. And then she drove us around, as was required in California, with, with, with parental accompaniment for, uh, for six months at every opportunity. Uh, the difference was, was astounding. And it certainly, it started making me think about um, about this. Now, uh, they both found and find being separated from their iPhones for more than a few minutes an unbearable hardship. Um, and that uh, when asked, do you want to go camping with us, the question is usually, do they have cell reception? Right, so that's the, that's the standard. So uh, with that, uh, we began a study of this. Now, I should note that uh, Evelyn Blumenberg, my faculty um, uh, co-author, uh, in chair of urban planning, also happens to be my spouse. Now, a little side story about this is that I was really curious about these things, and I, with a PhD student, wrote a grant proposal to the University of California Transportation Center to study teens and travel. And, you know, we're busy. I just never mentioned it to my, to my wife. She actually wrote a grant to the Federal Highway Administration to study teens and travel. And hadn't it mentioned to me, we both got awarded about the same time and realized that you know, researchers are affected by things that go around the, uh, uh, that go on around them. And so we ended up co sort of combining forces with some really terrific doctoral students, one of whom is now an assistant professor at Rutgers to look at this issue. Um, we then, when we completed the first phase of this work, and we're, we're deep into the second part, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, uh, we got additional funding from the Federal High Administration to look at this. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the uh, motivation. I'm going to talk about sort of the issues involved in the theories, what some of the research design was. I won't go into too much detail on that. Then I'll talk about PMT, which is person miles of travel, trips, mode choice, and travel type analysis, and then I'll try and wrap it up. Okay, so our research questions uh, at the start were teens and young adults, do they travel differently than older adults? Secondly, do they travel differently than youth of previous generations, which are two different questions, right? Uh, and then what's behind any of these observed differences? And are these likely to persist over time? And then fourth, do young travelers logically cluster into types based on their behavior? Can we kind of classify different kinds of travelers? And that's essentially what's motivated our work. So what are our variables of interest? So one issue that when you, if you read the popular press is that it's all information and communications technology. Why 
why have to travel around when you can be in constant communication with your peeps? Um, the second is the difficulty of finding employment in a prolonged economic downturn as a cause. Third are just changes in household structure, the boomerang effect in the, the number of advertisements making fun of the 20-something living in the basement playing Halo when they should be out looking for work is, uh, is legion. And then there's also been, across the country, increasingly stringent driver's license regulations. It's just a lot harder to get a license now than it used to be. And so maybe that's something behind it as well. So we thought about those as different kinds of variables that we try and investigate in one way or another simultaneously. Because what we found is a lot of the previous research sort of looked at one of these things and didn't really try to control for the others. So here are some, just some, some basic data from the, the period before we, were, we started our work. So teen employment, that is the number of teens, uh, this is between 15 and 19, who were employed and paid work, uh, was 40% in 2001. And uh, about 33% of young adults between, uh, between 18 and 26 were living at home, about a third. Okay? By 2009, teen employment was below 20%. It had been halved. And boomeranging it increased to 58%. Uh, and so these are two big effects that could directly or indirectly affect travel. Uh, so what we did is we looked at whether people were employed, and we looked at full and part-time, uh, and then uh, a young adult, or 19 to 26, uh, living with parents. So here's just a, a kind of a look at that. And while, uh, and remember when we show this, this shows unemployment. This is not teens who are, and young adults who are not working. These are teens and young adults who are either working or looking for work. Okay, so anyone who chooses not to be in the labor force is excluded from these. So you can see that in general, going back to the, the early part of the last century, there wasn't that much difference between uh, young, uh, young, young adult and older adult employment. It's typically been higher, in part because uh, young people have less human capital than older folks. But you can see the huge bump up in the recession, right? So that uh, we then had, and it continued up, I'll have some data later, up over 20%. And it's actually hovered there. It's just below 20% now. It stayed very high persistently, even though the overall unemployment rate has, has dropped. So here's another way of looking at it. In 2010, 10% of those between 16 and 65, or I guess all over 16, were, were unemployed. 20% between uh, 16 and 24, compared to just 8% between 25 and 64. So we have a huge difference. Uh, and again, those are only for people who are employed or looking for work. Uh, with respect to boomeranging, uh, I was sort of alarmed to see that it had always been pretty high. Um, and I, I, I'm going to shed a tear when my, last, uh, my younger daughter moves out, although I'll shed a tear if 10 years later they're still there. Um, but it has, it has climbed up, and it's extremely high. And uh, what we see is that uh, it's tailed up as well for even people up into, into their early 30s. Okay. So uh, another way of looking at this over the, the data we have is that in 1990, uh, among those between 19 and 26 who did not live with parents was two-thirds and lived with parents was, was a third. By 2009, it was uh, uh, about three in five lived with parents. So this is a huge change, really, really big. Um, and then we also can look at uh, sort of, this is um, uh, youth and adult. And again, at youth here, we're having, uh, this one is between uh, uh, 15 and 26. Uh, and I, I, I could explain during Q&A why we chose 26 as a cutoff. But uh, there's a lot more free time uh, and less time spent at work as a result of um, uh, for young people in the way that they use they use time, and a lot of this related to they're spending less time working. Um, so uh, I look at this graph and I then get my kids to take the recycling out or something like that. It, um, so the question then is, what about mobile communications? We have the economy, we have boomeranging. Uh, you know, what is the, the reason? You know, growing up, I had a big issue that I couldn't be on the phone because somebody might try to call. Uh, and in my era, actually, when you called, it was a busy signal. And uh, later we got call waiting, which was a big innovation. And I eventually had to get my own phone. And phones for you young people were actually attached to places and not people. And uh, it was hard. There was a lot of logistics that went on in, in uh, getting connected. 
And I know Mei Po Kwan, who, uh, a geographer, has been looking at this way that, that teens and young adults now make more and more social plans in real time. They have a vague plan to get together. This is something that drives me crazy. So where you're going out? Yeah, with who? Well, I don't know yet. It's, it's going to be from this subset of 11 people. Where are you going? Well, we'll see. And then in real time, they decide where they are and then what they're going to do. And even as younger, when they'd get at the mall, they would split up and come back together constantly, uh, sort of in a Brownian motion sort of thing. And uh, I was actually hearing a talk by her and our, the travel modeler for the Bay Area says, this terrifies me. We can't, we can't analyze this. this is their, nothing is based on all of these formula, uh, formal patterns. Everything's occurring in real time. It's very contingent. And so the question is, this has to be affecting travel. So there are two arguments, and I understand that uh, Pat Mokhtarian has been here and, and spoken. One is that it, it should be a substitute for travel. Well, you don't need to physically go and connect with your BFF if you can be texting and, and Snapchatting all, you know, all day. It isn't as important to go to the physical effort to get together. And so it should substitute for travel. Uh, and then others and, uh, argue that it's a complement for travel, is that actually the opportunity to connect creates more reasons to get together. And so uh, the question, uh, we didn't have the greatest data from this source, but it asked, you know, uh, do you use the web daily? And we, we were able to operationalize it with those data. And so this just gives you a picture of how important it is. So 62 and over, 45% uh, uh, of the population never uses the web. Those 27 to 16, it's 14%, just 6% for those 15 to 26, and uh, much larger proportions for those who use the web almost daily compared to those older. And none of that should surprise us at all. Okay, then there's graduated driver's license laws. And this has been an interesting phenomenon, and, it, and created for a natural experiment, because between about 1990 and 2010, we went from having virtually no graduated driver's licenses to virtually every state having a graduated driver's license. So that means that when our first cut of the data in 1990, we had almost no one with graduated di driver's license. In 2001, we had a mix. And then in 2010, we have almost complete coverage. Uh, now, it varies from state to state, but they are more restrictive. In some states, uh, there's, there's actually a way that the, the National Institute of Insurance Safety rates these, these programs, and we use their rating system to kind of evaluate that. So it was a point system. They use poor, marginal, fair, and good. We tried to change that into less uh, normative terms, but it just would be less stringent or more stringent. And so indeed, we see this uh, with the licensing rates of 16-year-olds, is that um, uh, into the late 90s, about 45% licensed when they were 16. And you would see another big chunk, if we put it for 17, of 30, 35% or so so that by 18, virtually everyone was licensed. And this has dropped off uh, to below 35%, down around 30%, which is really uh, a, a big difference, and significantly down. And there's also other kinds of restrictions on driving, and we, I won't go into the details, but for example, we saw a big increase in solo driving among 16-year-olds. Any idea why? Those of you who had graduated driver's licenses? Yeah, you're not allowed to have your friends in the car. So you actually have to drive uh, alone. So we saw this, this odd blip. Um, and so this gives you a picture of that transition, right? So 42% had what they described as weak, uh, uh, and 9% as marginal in 1990, so that by 2008, 30, uh, 30 of the states, not 30%, 30 of the states had uh, very strong or stringent programs, and another 12 uh, that were fairly strong. So big, big transition over time. So our data is uh, a commonly used uh, source. Uh, it's the 1990-2001-2009 uh, uh, National Household Travel Survey. Uh, I thought I had changed it. In 1995, we used for some of the analysis as well. Uh, we looked at teens, 15 to 18, young adults, 19 to 26, adults, 27 uh, to 61. We did that by looking at actually uh, via uh, uh, person miles of travel and, and looking at where there were breakpoints. And we see a big break point at, uh, so there's a long slope up to 26, and then things tend to level off. And then at about 61, they start to tail off. So uh, we, we sort of chose it from the data. In uh, another analysis later, we actually looked for a different reason, a slightly older, older group. Uh, phase one, we looked at metropolitan areas only and trips under 75 miles, which are daily, daily trips. Uh, uh, phase two, we foolishly are trying to do the entire US uh, 
And uh, we've looked at person miles of travel, daily trips, uh, commute mode, social trip mode, and traveler types. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on all of those, but those are the things we looked at. And just to give you a flavor, I promise I won't clutter you up with a, a lot of data, is that for the person miles of travel, we estimated uh, uh, regression models, essentially, of, for, both, uh, for each of these groups. And we looked at uh, sort of combining all of the years. For trips, we used a structural equation model. Uh, for the commute and social mode trips, we used a discrete choice model. And then for the traveler types, we used latent class analysis to identify these different classes of travelers, uh, just to give you a, a flavor for the analyses that were done. So what's our conceptual model? Well, we have these variables of interest that I've just talked about. And we have individual characteristics. We know from lots of research that uh, travel behavior changes by age, by sex, by race, ethnicity, by driver status, by education. We know those things. We also know that things like household income, household structure, uh, the nature of the household, whether you used to live alone or with a partner, whether you have children, and then autos per adult, which is not really a household structure, has a, has a huge effect as well. And then residential characteristics, so the density where one lives, uh, whether one lives in a large metro area or not, uh, and a variety of other factors, but those are significant ones that have also been shown to consistently influence travel behavior. Okay? So what we want to do is control for the three boxes on the left so that we can analyze the independent effect of those things on the right. We also uh, did, a, did really a pseudo co cohort analysis because we're interested in, remember, how do teens today compare to teens in the past? And so we had three data sets, and so we tried to think about age or life cycle effects, and these are things that occur as one ages, one's behavior changes. Uh, period effects, so that people who lived through the Depression, the Second World War, uh, the Great Recession, that those will have effects that will stamp the entire population as it moves through. And then finally, cohort effects, that are things about the cohort, when people couple up, when they have children, when they, they move through, and then that cohort follows through as well. So you can have all three of these things over time influencing behavior. So what we did, and there is one uh, small mistake on here, but uh, is that we would take, for example, if you take born in the 1960s, we have 1990 data, 2001 and 2009. Well, the 1990 data, they were between 21 and 30. Uh, 2001, they were between 32 and 41. And 2009, they're between 40 and 49. If we look down this way, we can get a rough approximation from those three data sets of people in their 30s born in the 70s, in their 30s born in the 60s, in their 30s born in the 50s. And we can kind of see how those people, it's not the same people, right? We aren't following them through time, but we can kind of estimate a pseudo cohort to look at this. This should not say 30 to 39, it should be 20 to 29 for you sharp eyed people out there. I couldn't correct it on the airplane, so. Okay, so first let's, let me talk a little bit about person miles traveled. Uh, often uh, traffic engineers focus on vehicle miles traveled. We're interested in how people get around n without regard to whether they're traveling in a vehicle, they're walking, they're biking, traveling by other means. Uh, we estimated our model in, in the way that uh, I just showed with these factors, trying to control for things. Um, just to give you a picture of PMT uh, by age group by year, you can see that things peak in the middle of one's life. Uh, they're much less below 15. You can see this slope up for people who are in that youth category, and then it tails off for people over 62. You also notice that in 2009, things are down pretty much for every, everybody. They climbed up a bit after 1990, uh, hit a peak in 2001, and kind of declined a lot. So these sig uh, declines are significant enough when aggregated together, you start to see overall declines in spite of growing population. So if we look at our models, and I just tried to present this in a way that's, that's fairly comprehensible, we can ask, what factors of our variables of interest, I'm not showing you all the control variables, what factors are associated with, uh, with PMT? And what we find is that worker status being employed, and I'm not showing the coefficients here, is consistently, significantly, statistically significantly associated with, uh, with PMT, more travel. So being people who are employed travel more, every single year across every age group, no matter what. A young adult living at home, those blue and zeros, these are all UCLA colors. Um, uh, and you notice the red is bad, that's USC. I have that on there, it's not on this particular one. But um, that has no effect. So we do find that people boomeranging travel differently, but once you control for their individual characteristics, whether you're living at home or whether you're out, we had, we had no statistical effect whatsoever. 
Technology and web use, we found uh, that in 2009, it was related to person miles of travel, but positively. And that is, is there wasn't, why, why is this NA in 1990? There was no web. There was no web in 1990. So uh, it had sort of a neutral effect as it was gearing up, but we find that it has uh, a significant effect positive for all age groups, not just teens. Okay, those who people use the web daily, but is it a substitute or a complement? Did travel get substituted? It was a complement. So the more people use the web, the more they have access to the phone, the more traveling they're doing, not the less. So Pat Mokhtarian's theory is sort of supported by the data we see here. And this, uh, you know, when I first got into this business, 30 years ago, we were saying, oh, yeah, well, technology is going to replace all this travel. This has been a fairly consistent effect that's been observed, is the more people communicate, the more traveling they do. Now, you might say, hey, well, those people also tend to have more income. Remember, we're controlling for income and auto access and other things like that as well. License stringency, what the heck is going on here? There's no negative effect on travel. And why would license stringency of people who are not subject to the license stringency rules be positively associated with travel? Any ideas? Yeah, it could be more, more chauffeuring might be going on. So they might be doing a little extra driving. But uh, it's certainly not having a negative effect on PMT. And it is on VMT. So there is effect, and that, that's a sign that people are getting around and getting to things, but they may not be driving as much. And that may be a positive outcome. So we really can't argue that, uh, that license stringency, which has mostly been driven by safety concerns, is somehow suppressing people's mobility or young people's mobility. We just don't see evidence of that. Okay, then uh, one of the things that we did was to say, after we controlled for all of these factors we analyzed, do we see any residual effect associated with the cohort? That is, is that being born in that decade, do we see some effect on travel behavior? And in fact, uh, people born in the 1960s, after you control for age, income, household structure, access to autos, and on and on and on, they still travel a bit more than everybody else. Uh, people born in the 80s are less, and people born in the 90s quite a bit less. And remember, we're only comparing similar age groups here. We're not just comparing generally born in that. So we're saying, if you're in your 20s in this, how do you compare with the 20s, and how do you compare with the 30s and the 40s? So we do see some effect. So that actually provides some evidence of support for the idea that there is some generational change in travel behavior, that there is something about this younger generation that is traveling a bit less. Uh, and while 18% looks like a lot, uh, what I'm going to show you later suggests that it is statistically significant, but it's not the tail that's wagging the dog. Okay, Okay. there is a little sidelight here. I've done lots of work on demographics in the past, sort of how people by race, ethnicity, or, or sex travel. And this looks at the uh, number of trips by men over those by women. So what this says is, among teens in 1990, that, uh, that uh, uh, male teens were making about one trip more per day than female teens. And that uh, among young adults, it was about two and a half trips more. And among uh, adults 27 to 61, it was about four trips more. And this has been a fairly consistent finding. Uh, and that over time, that that has tended to collapse a little as more women go into the labor force and a variety of other things. But that trip making, you can see, is quite a bit different among adults. However, look at the pattern among uh, teen uh, boys and girls, men and women. And that is, is that beginning in 2001, we now see girls, women, making one more trip per day on average than men. And in 2009, one and a half trips more. So this is sort of a significant change that we're observing. And there's been a lot of research going in general about Differences in economic status, in uh, higher levels of, of women enrolling in college. There's a lot of things that are happening that, that are, may be behind this. This was not what we were focusing on, but I found it really fascinating because it's a significant change from what we'd observed, and yet we see those issues later. Okay, so let me just summarize some of the things that we found without going through you know, too many graphs and charts. But one thing to think about is we found consistent effects. That is, there are travel behavior effects that are, that are significant for teens, young adults, but, but middle-aged and older adults as well. There are divergent effects 
where teens and adults are very different, there are sort of demographic effects that we're seeing and then societal change effects. And let me quickly go through those. So being employed is, in fact, the tail that wags the dog. Okay? It's positive and its influence on travel, this is PMT, is increasing over time. For teens, being employed alone results in uh, 2.33 uh, you know, uh, times as much travel, or 133% more travel than not being employed. And that doesn't mean unemployed or whether you're working or not, but just being employed has a huge effect. And that that is, that is a growing. Now, whether or not you're a driver, meaning you have a license and are able to drive, that has a positive effect. So being a driver has a positive effect on your person miles of travel. The gap is smaller for teens and young adults than for older adults, meaning whether or not you're a driver has a bigger effect for someone 27 to 61 on how much they get around than someone 15 to, uh, to 26. And that sort of makes sense, right? Because you're getting chauffeured more and things like that. Uh, density, the development density, the measured as population density, is negative for all ages. That is, is the more dense the area, the lower the PMT. Now, that doesn't mean you're worse off. It often means you just don't have to travel as far to get to the things that you need to get to. Right? So people in Manhattan might be getting to lots of things, but they're not traveling physically very far through space to do it. Uh, in, in, in rural Vermont, they might be traveling a long way. So density has that effect. And it's consistent across age group. So what are some divergent effects? And a lot of these make sense. So um, autos per adult. Uh, that is, is how many autos are there in the household uh, uh, of driving age? And it has a much bigger effect for young adults than for adults. What does that suggest? It's a bigger effect. It suggests that the adults have the call on the car. And so when there's a shortage of cars, the older folks get the car and the, and the, the teen or young adult is out of luck. For, uh, for uh, teens, there's a declining effect over time. So that... that that Risa, my daughter phenomenon, that the cars may be around, but they're not, they're not taking up uh, driving as much as before. And then household composition. This also sort of makes sense. For adults, if you add an additional uh, adult in the household, there's less person miles of travel. And that's because you can divide the household travel among a larger number of people. When you add an extra child, there's more PMT. Because now you have to chauffeur more. For teens, it's the exact opposite. When there's an extra adult in the household, there's more PMT. Why? There's more chauffeurs in the household. Okay? The extra child, there's competition for that chauffeuring, and there's less PMT. So it's precisely the opposite effect. And then the household income uh, has a big effect uh, on, on the, the travel of uh, adults, but it has less effect on teens. So employment has a big effect, but income itself, the, the effect is weakening. Okay, race, ethnicity, and this was kind of a shocker to us. If you do any research on race, ethnicity, there's always clear and consistent patterns on, on race, ethnicity. After you control for everything in the world, African Americans tend to ride public transit more than other racial ethnic groups. Uh, you see more intergenerational chauffeuring in uh, Asian Pacific Islander households, things like this. We saw for, in 1990 that uh, African American Latino uh, households, there was less PMT after you controlled for everything, okay? which was consistent with the literature. In 2009, we found there was more, which startled us a little bit. But the, the effects were just marginally significant, so we're, we're not super sure about that. What we did find, though, is there was absolutely no relationship between race, ethnicity, and travel among teens. And uh, we don't have good evidence of that yet, but I tend to think that that, is a, uh, that will be an enduring uh, factor. Now, one thing is that you slide back into these differences across race, ethnicity, Another is that that will be enduring, that there's, we're observing less distinctions by race ethnicity. So for gender, again, we're seeing more travel among women. So the questions are these life cycle effects or these cohort effects? And uh, we're doing some follow-up research on this. OK, then the societal change effects. These are the things that we'd cared about at the beginning. I'm going to take this. It seems very stuffy in here, so I'm going to take off my jacket. Uh, with respect to, to uh, boomeranging, we saw less driving among those living at home in 1990 when there was a lot less boomeranging, but no effect afterwards. With technology, web use was associated with 20 to 30 percent more person miles of travel. So it's not a small effect. It's quite significant, and it was a complement for travel in all ages. 
And licensing uh, was associated with lower PMT for 15-year-olds in that transition area, but in general that didn't have much effect. So a lot of our theories that had been bandied around in the New York Times and in, in the New Yorker and all these things, were, they, were, they were falling flat. Uh, so aside from employment, which had a very large effect, these were all somewhat muted. So remember, uh, we have essentially a finding that looks like this from the early part of our work, that economic factors predominate. You know, the economy and mobility were really tracking one another. The other effects were, were mixed. Demographic travel distinctions were, f were fading, but there was some evidence of generational effects in travel. Okay, so now let me talk about trips for a minute. And each one of these I'm going to go shorter because it repeats some of those. Um, so trips are really important and understudied by transportation folks because trips are sort of the raison d'etre of travel. They are a proxy for activity participation. And in general we find that trips go up with income, uh, they go up with measures of life satisfaction, except for extreme levels. So there can always be too much of a good thing, but in general the more activities that someone can participate in, the better. Um, and mobility itself is a very indirect measure of activity participation because you can drive a long way to make one trip or walk a few blocks to do something. And we, we should think of travel as a means, not an end, but trips are more like the end. Okay, so here is what it looks like from 91 to 2009 on the average trips per day. So you can see that it increased and right away. What was going on in 1990 relative to 2001? We were in a mild recession in 1990. The economy was at the tail end of a boom in 2001, and we were falling into a major recession in 2009. But notice as well the difference between youth and young adults. They were tracking more closely, and we started to see a, a bigger gap. This is another way of looking at it, is this is, uh, this, uh, this should be just zero here in the, in the middle. But this is for each age group how the average in trip making varied from 2001 to 2009. And for almost every age it was lower. So we used a structural equations model because one of the things that it's sort of a circular logic, one of the, the biggest single predictor of, of travel is often whether you have a car. Well, that's kind of a circular logic. So what we tried to do is say, well, what explains whether people have a car? How does having a car influence uh, uh, travel? And then how does income and other factors independently affect travel? And then we get an estimate of the number of trips. And we find that income is a very powerful predictor of trip making among adults. And the importance of predicted youth trips by income, and remember before I talked about PMT, now I'm talking about trips, actually increased over time. Okay? It's now on par of that with adults. And the most effect important effect of income is actually increasing access to auto, which in turn encourages more trips. So then we can say, is there an independent cohort effect on making trips? Well, maybe. Born in the 60s, we see a little more trip making. Born in the 1990s, a little bit less. Okay, now a quick glance at commute mode. Uh, this is always a shocker to people who live in Los Angeles and especially in New York, but most people are getting uh, to work in a car, uh, even young adults, and you can see the distribution across there uh, uh, with youth and adults. Uh, drive alone to work is higher with adults uh, than, uh, than younger, younger folks. And so then we can ask, uh, for the journey to work, what's the independent effect of the cohort? And there we're seeing something interesting, is that actually you're more likely, if you're employed, to drive to work when you're young than at, a, than at any other age, which is sort of counterintuitive. How is it that people are traveling less if they're more likely to be driving alone to work? Well, remember, what was the biggest predictor of whether people were traveling more was whether they had a job. And so what we find is there's this split between those who are employed and those who aren't, and that we're aggregating those together in a lot of the data. So we don't see much effect of all of those, those things like licensing and, and web use and, uh, on commute mode, and most of them are uh, related to economic factors. Um, and income is strongly and positively associated with driving alone, uh, young adults are a little less likely to carpool, more likely to use public transit. Uh, and again, uh, daily web users uh, were traveling more as well. Okay, so what do we find from all of this? And that is that economic factors predominate.
The vast majority of declines in driving uh, and travel among teens and young adults is explained by very high youth unemployment and limited access to private vehicles. The other f effects of other factors are relatively small by comparison. But you say, Brian, so what about, uh, okay, so some teens are hurting, but what about all those hipsters abandoning their cars and moving back to the city and driving rents up in cute towns like Burlington? And um, this is sort of the current narrative. Driving's down, and that's a good thing. It certainly is for the environment. For the environment and for cities. Vehicle travel started declining before the Great Recession. It did. But we actually see declines in, in youth unemployment preceding the recession, as well as household debt preceding the recession. So we saw a lot of things combining to decrease uh, financial access to vehicles. Young people are rejecting the suburbs and moving back to the city, and we're in, in, involved. There is strong evidence that that's going on, and we're, we're looking at those data now in, an, in a nationwide study. And these hip, educated new urbanistas favor mobile devices, walking, biking, Lyft and Uber, a new urban rail system and, uh, and public transit over cars. So that's kind of what we see going on. There's this back to the city movement. And uh, that's kind of exciting to, to think about. And what I want to argue is that that is in fact going on, but that's not all that's going on. Okay. So we employed a, a latent class analysis, which essentially takes and classifies people by their travel behavior so that the within group variation is minimized and the w between group variation is maximized. And we used uh, 95 rather than 1990 because the data are more comparable for what we wanted to do. We looked at all travelers in the country and we expanded the age range from 16 to 32 based on the literature looking at markers to adulthood, sort of the range between when people move out on their own, get a car, couple up, have kids, those, a variety of those things. So we classified urbanistas, what we call drivers, what we call people who are stuck in place, multimodal travelers, and long distance trekkers. So through lots of iterations, we identified these, four, uh, these five classes. And then I'm going to present some data on what happens on the travel day. So PMT, trips, and share of miles by non-auto mode, long-term travel, and then transit use in the past two months, because in many areas, transit level is pretty low. So first, let's look at this, uh, what I've circled here. Urban East is 5.7 trips per day. So they're engaging in lots of activities. These people are more likely to be educated. They're more likely to be um, uh, um, living in a city, they're more likely to have a car available, These are but they're making lots of trips. Uh, drivers are averaging four and a half trips a day. People who are multimodal, meaning they're traveling lots by all sorts of modes, 4.9 trips a day, and long distance trekkers, five and a half trips a day. So we see kind of a robust level of trip making, except for those stuck in place. Two trips a day, that's one trip out and one trip back, on average for the whole group, okay? So in terms of person miles of travel, we see a couple of extremes. Urbanistas are averaging about 25 PMT a day. Drivers, people who primarily get around a car, around 30 PMT a day. Multimodal people who are really traveling on biking, walking, cars, public transit, 23. Then we see two outliers. The stuck in place people are only traveling seven miles per day on average, while the long distance trekkers are averaging 171. So these are people who for, and we, we anticipate these are usually transitional things where people are doing something unusual and traveling a long distance. The share of miles by, uh, by uh, non-auto mode for urbanistas, they're getting a quarter of their travel by means other than driving in a car. Drivers, almost none. Stuck in place, almost all. Uh, the multimodal people, a little over half, and the long distance trekkers are almost exclusively in cars as well. Autos per adult, this is the access to the cars. We see urbanistas, there's almost a one-to-one -one urbanista to, uh, to car access, but they're traveling by, they're, they're walking, they're biking, they're doing other things. Okay, drivers, about one-to-one. -one. Uh, multimodal folks have cars available. And the long distance truckers, not surprisingly, do as well. But look at stuck in place. Far level over, there's three people for every two cars in the stuck in place group. Uh, the percent driver, uh, we see that, uh, that stuck in place and multimodal are, are much lower as well. And we can kind of look at it like this. That you have l the difference between the multimodal people is they have access to a car, but they're not driving that much. The stuck in place people have lower levels of access to car and they're not driving as much. And then finally, transit use. Uh, the multimodal people, uh, <laughs> even 50% of them are never driving, are never taking transit. That means they're biking and walking a lot. Um, 
And then you can see among frequent transit users, uh, it's only the drivers who are, who are rarely, if ever, using transit. OK. Now, that should prompt a question in your mind. So how many urbanistas, drivers, stuck in placers, multimodalists, and long distance truckers are out there? I'll be interested to see what you think. And are their numbers changing over time? And the answer to that is yes. Okay. So first, drivers. And this should warm the cockles of, of the heart of anyone who's trying to deal with the problems of auto dependence. Uh, in 1995, 75 percent of the population primarily made all of their travel in cars. By 2009, that was down to two thirds. That's a pretty remarkable shift, and uh, and and looks very kind of uh, um, promising in many ways. The long distance trekkers, not surprisingly, there aren't a lot of them. That's a lot of miles a day, right? These are people who are traveling really long distances. Um, and that's dropped from 7% to 4% over this, uh, this time period. The urbanistas are up by 50%. But it's from 2 to 3%. So what could be going on? Part of it, I think, is that it, you know, all of my former students are writing these articles, and they're all urbanistas. And they're all hanging out in coffee houses in San Francisco and in West Hollywood. And, and uh, this is a really small share of the population. The multimodalists, oh, uh, that's also increased by 50%, but up to 3%. And here's the worrisome sign. These are the people who are much less likely to be employed, much more likely to be low income, much less likely to have access to a car, uh, and hardly getting around at all. These are people who are averaging two trips a day. It's increased from 14% to nearly a quarter of the population of young adults. OK? So are there more urbanista and multimodalists out there? There absolutely are. And, the, and it's up about 50%, but from a very small base. But I would argue, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, that the recession has been devastating to young people, and that what we're seeing is not an encouraging. I'm happy to see urbanistas and multimodalists driving less, because they're getting lots of trips. They're thriving. But there's a large and growing share of the population that's not working, that's not traveling, and that is driving, if you'll pardon the pun, most of the decline of VMT that's going on. And this is very sobering. So we can really think about a quarter of the population being stuck in place. So let me wrap up. Uh, the principal findings is that economic factors uh, really seem to be driving a lot of what's going on. Um, about a quarter of all young travelers are stuck in place. The effects of the other factors that we looked at are mixed, specifically information communications technology, which has a slight positive effect, graduated driver's license. Demographic distinctions among travelers are fading. But we see some evidences of, of generational shifts in travel behavior. Employment status, household income, and other measures of uh, economic status all strongly influence uh, youth and uh, adult travel behavior. And these factors have even a greater influence on the travel of youth than adults. Uh, the effects of living with the parents, uh, those other things are just milder. Okay? Uh, and, and unfortunately, technology seems to be associated with more travel, not less. And uh, most teens are licensing later, but we're seeing evidence that they are licensing uh, at close to the levels before. They're just taking a lot longer curve to get up there. Uh, these regulations are associated with lower person miles of travel of the short term, but not much change in trips. Um, I think I'd mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, all things equal, younger generations appear to be traveling fewer miles, making somewhat fewer trips, but for a variety of reasons, some positive and some quite sobering. Um, then there's this weird thing. Among those people who are employed, you young people are actually more likely to drive to work than your elder uh, brethren and sistren. So nine out of 10 young adults are either highly mobile drivers or relatively immobile, stuck in place. Those people who are traveling long distances who are living in, in cities, living the urban lifestyle, are multimodal travelers, just account for one in 10 travelers. And that's a very different picture than the prevailing narrative. But what about my daughters? So Risa is now 20. She finally got her license. Why did she get her license? Because she realized 
that her younger sister was on track to get her license and that she could make a claim on that car. She got her license, I'm not making this up, two days before her sister. I'm convinced that had she not had a younger sister, she'd still be unlicensed. She drives very little. Um, uh, and uh, even though her parents pay for the insurance and maintenance, uh, she's had trouble getting part-time jobs back from Ohio over the summer, and gas is expensive. Uh, it's relatively easy to get around Oberlin uh, on foot and West LA without a car, so she doesn't drive much. Maya, now 17, is a far more enthusiastic driver. She shares with the car with her sister, and she would love to drive everywhere all of the time, but she too is reluctant to spend her hard-earned sitting money. She thinks it's completely unreal unreasonable that her parents will only pay for the insurance and the maintenance, but make them pay for the gas. Um, and she bums rides as much as possible. Unlike Risa, who's an enthusiastic transit user, Maya abhors transit, much to her father's uh, chagrin, uh, and refuses to get on it. I occasionally make her in turn to get, to get something. If you're interested in the full report on this on phase one, it's available at this website. Uh, we've got six papers out uh, uh, for review with journals. Uh, we're doing Right now, uh, a way of we're, we're developing a typology of all of the census tracts in the country based on their physical characteristics, and we're going to try and match that that cluster uh, analysis, or the, um, uh, the the latent class analysis of the different types of drivers to different types of neighborhoods to see how much of a relationship we see between those characteristics. And that's all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Coming. And then I also want to remind everybody that there is a reception with food and refreshment just in the other side of the building. So in the other round room across the way that there would be more opportunities for you to interact in a little bit more of a personal um, and uh, intimate setting. So uh, with that, uh, feel free if there are questions. Yeah, we're close to, if you need to go, that's fine. If you want to ask questions, that's fine as well. Yes. Um, oh, thanks. So, oh, <laughs> I have to ask if your, the latent class analysis, if that varies by demographics, by race, ethnicity, gender, did, so uh, particularly so, the stuck so, in place. So it was determined by, uh, by travel behavior. But then we can go through, which I didn't show, and look. Um, the stuck in place are far more likely to be immigrant, far more likely to be African American, Latino, far more likely. Uh, more likely to have um, lower levels of education, more likely to be unemployed, um, more likely to be living in their parents and be living in central city areas. So part of this, in, in this again, I think that we see two phenomena. I do think that we're going to see evidence of young educated people moving back into urban areas. But we also have people who grew up in those areas who, who can't leave because essentially they're economically isolated. And it's just that the scale of the one, and I'd love to see those flipped in terms of proportions. But I, you know, I think the, the story there is a lot of, of, now that's not to say there are still, now this is, uh, this is all in the country. We also see um, among sort of the, the Anglo stuck in place people, they're often more likely to be in rural areas. Um, and that's where we're doing some of the, the geographic analysis. So you have, uh, and, and it can be in, in, in suburbs as well, but they're, they're much more likely. That's not to say that all of them are unemployed or all of them are minority, but in terms of proportions, I, you know, I, it, I just I overwhelm, overwhelmed you with data already, but they're, they're much more likely to be unemployed, uh, African-American, Latino, lower levels of education, lower levels of auto access. Yeah. I'm old enough, so I've seen most of the years you studied. My uh, little anecdotal uh, narrative is that today's relatively affluent kids have traded their driver's license for a passport, and they travel by plane uh, to exotic places, and maybe later, as you've uh, implied, they'll get back into cars. I didn't hear the word airplane in your presentation. This is all metropolitan day trips of under 75 miles. Okay, so we just looked at kind of the flows. Well, the first half was all metropolitan day trips of under 75 miles. 
The second part is day trips of 75 miles, but in all areas. So I understand there are folks here doing quite a bit of work on inner city travel. That's, <clears throat> unfortunately, these data sets aren't sort of merged and allow for that kind of analysis. I have every reason to believe that that's a, that's a reasonable hypothesis, especially among the educated uh, youth. My Oberlin daughter is actually in Florence right now on uh, her, her year abroad. Uh, so I think that that may well be taken. It's not clear though, remember, we do see some residual effect of less travel. So even if there's full economic recovery, the, the cohort model suggests that there will be some smaller amount of, of uh, vehicle travel by this younger generation, you know, if these, these trends hold. But the, it's, it's the, the lion's share and then a small share. So it's not likely the big, the big driver of this decline in vehicle travel is, is likely economic factors. But that's a, with respect to, to inner city travel, I think that's a reasonable hypothesis. Uh, yeah, over here and then here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you were presenting so much inf interesting information as kind of overwhelming. And yeah, sorry about I that. I, okay. I think, oh, I have to include uh, that too. So, I'm curious about. Uh, you briefly mentioned household composition, and I'm wondering in terms of sort of changing trends in family formation and when young adults have kids, to what extent that may make a difference. In yeah, so, so the work we're doing now, I mentioned briefly that, that sort of, um, there's a whole sociological literature that I had been heretofore unfamiliar with that looks at uh, what they call markers of adulthood. And the, the rate at which those markers have been stretching is at an extraordinarily, uh, what I would say is apparent, alarming rate. And that they have things like uh, when you get a license, the first time that you go out on your own, uh, the, the first time that you might travel, and it could be by any means walking or biking out by yourself, when you essentially you know, live away from your parents, when you couple up in one way or another, uh, if you have kids, when that happens. And that has been, you know, actually been stretching you know, for the last century, but over the last two decades, that has been going like this. And that the, um, one of the biggest factors is among, uh, which is most remarkable, is among educated, the age at which educated uh, couples have children is getting so much later, and that among poor single parents has been getting younger. So you're seeing this huge divide between younger and younger single moms and older and older sort of educated uh, uh, parents. And so that's why we expanded that later to look at 16 to 32 and to try to understand what was going on with those. But um, uh, on here, Kelsey Ralph, um, I just went to her, her wedding on Kodiak Island, Alaska. That's where I came from. She, uh, this is a big part of her dissertation, looking at sort of these changes in the markers of adulthood and the, and the, the effect of that. So it's, um, it has both a strong effect, but the, the change in, the, in the, the cycle of composition is really changing rapidly right now. Yeah, you had a question. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> throughout your talk, you were talking about personal miles traveled. In the end, it sort of came back to vehicle miles traveled, and you also, in the middle, made a distinction, a point that there is a distinction there. So when you were talking about uh, the effect of technology, you were talking about it, actually, the personal miles traveled increased, but I was wondering about the effect on vehicle miles traveled and whether or not it's the same or you haven't looked at that at all. Because uh, the Frontier study that came out a couple of years ago report mentioned this issue of, of technology and seemed to be indicating that it was leading to less vehicle miles traveled. Now, they could be, those two phenomenons can exist together. They, they can. The, most of the research on this has been with respect to vehicle miles of travel. And um, I would say that, that uh, and this is from the literature, and a lot of it is, is again, Pat Mokhtarian has looked at this extensively. Um, and has found, uh, in most cases, no statistically significant relationship one way or the other. But when there is a statistically significant relationship, it's usually positive rather than negative. The effect is bigger for PMT, as you point out, than it is for VMT, though. So, but it's still up for VMT. Uh, it's you know. still, it, it, it more likely to say there's, n there's no measurable effect. And what that might suggest, that doesn't mean, when you say no measurable effect over a large uh, uh, population, that doesn't mean there's no effect. It could be that there, and, and that's how Pat describes it, there are things that push it up 
for some people and push it down for others, you sum it and you get zero. So that, uh, and she explains how certain kinds of things are likely to replace trips and that others are likely to stimulate them. And her research suggests that both of those things are going on. And that for certain populations and certain kinds of trips, you can show a big increase in travel. Other populations, other kinds of trips, a big decrease in travel. But as it sums over the population, you get little effect. Anything else? Yes, in the back. I'm wondering, Brian, especially since you used a lot of metropolitan data, if you saw any relationship to congestion or if you hypothesized there might be. Uh, I'm actually doing other research on the effect of travel on activity participation um, uh, using different data uh, because the, the NHTS is not a good uh, tool for using that because the level of geographic specificity is and not sufficient to do that. So uh, I've just completed one project, and I've just gotten funding that we're just embarking uh, on a second to, to look at this. And I think I described this to a couple of folks. And I'll, I'll try and be brief about it, but I think the findings are pretty interesting. I've always had this concern, and maybe that seems ridiculous here, but that, uh, that this idea of congestion sort of really dictating a lot of planning, that our goal is to eliminate congestion on the network, and that, that the network becomes the unit of analysis rather than an enabler of economic transactions and social interactions, because that's what transportation is supposed to do. And so uh, the, what got me going on that is I go to a play, I go to Paris, I go to Mexico City, I go to New York, and I think, well, these are pretty congested places, but they seem to be thriving. And why is it that I see these studies that come out that say, oh, it's a tremendous drag on the economy? And so what we did in the first phase is we looked at um, uh, travel survey data in, in metropolitan Los Angeles, and we were able to actually uh, estimate uh, d delays over the entire road network of Southern California, which is an area, you know, it was a, about 15 and a half million people in this, this sample. And we could look at where you lived and your relationship to, uh, to, to delay. And it varies, you know, contrary to your image maybe, but congestion is very severe in some places and, and nearly non-existent in others, and it, it gradates depending on the type of area. And what we did is we looked at the amount of activities that people participate in, and then we controlled for the usual suspects of demographic factors and household composition, income, things like that. And we said, what's the residual effect? And what we found is that in central areas, in places like uh, Santa Monica, West Hollywood, uh, uh, Newport Beach, things that might be uh, mixed use, higher income, trendy areas, and places like San Fernando and the San Gabriel Valley, which are very much ethnic neighborhoods, that we see more activity participation than we would expect, and it's correlated with the congestion. In other words, by cramming lots of activity and people together, it's actually stimulating more activity participation than in places where it's spread out. Then we could find other neighborhoods, uh, this would be in Compton, which is an economically depressed area, and outlying areas in the suburbs, where congestion was associated with lower levels of activity, activity participation. So what that suggests is, and the way, we, uh, way I put it in the paper is that if you make a place more like Manhattan, you can make it more congested and people can be better off as a result. They're able to engage in lots of activities. It makes it a more vibrant place. And if your goal was to get rid of congestion, you could actually be making essentially the quality of life lower. But if, you, if you're in suburban Houston and congestion gets worse, you're just worse off. Because the only thing you can do is drive to get to things. I hope there's no one here from Houston. Good. Um, you, you're just worse off. So you can say, actually, that as congestion worsens, it does affect uh, um, uh, activity. And so we're ju we've just finished this analysis, and we've gotten funding now where I have economic geographer friends who are very interested in agglomeration economies and how the profitability of high-tech firms and others can vary over very small spaces, that there's a benefit to being centrally located with other knowledge networks and things like that. Well, those tend to be in the more congested areas of Silicon Valley and in the film industry in Los Angeles. So what we're doing is we're combining these data to see whether we actually see higher levels of productivity in some crowded, congested areas. Because often arguments against new transit-oriented development, more concentrated development is it's going to make the world a worse place because it's going to increase congestion. 
And what we're trying to do is argue there are times where congestion just does make people worse off, but there's other times where the delay increases of congestion are more than obviated by the higher levels of accessibility of a, of a mixed environment. And it may not be a wash, but it may actually be a net positive. And we certainly see evidence of that in the LA data. And we're going to try and do a more comprehensive analysis, actually looking at the wages that firms pay over a fairly small geography, because we actually have congestion in both the Bay Area and LA on those as well. There, uh, essentially what we do is we, uh, it's, it's a process by which the, um, you can set the parameters of sort of how many classes you want. And what it tries to do is take the, what we took is those series of travel behavior variables I showed you, PMT, percent driver. And then it tries to make groups where the, the within group variance is minimized and the between group various variance is maximized. So it tries to make groups more different from one another and everybody in that group more similar with one another. So essentially, we allow it to create those classes. Then we go back and analyze that class and we came up with those names, but sort of which characterized. We found a more educated, young, uh, active, lots of activities, lots of cars available, not so many, uh, but not so much driving, and that was the urbanistas, the people who were traveling by bike and ped and transit and driving that we really found. Those tended to be uh, often the very uh, much younger people, but, but uh, a whole population. So what we do is we kind of go back and then allow, we allow it to classify on the basis of travel behavior, and then we go back and look at the demographics of those people, of those categories we've created. And what we found is that there was this group of people. I think, as I mentioned, it's more transitory. There are different times where you might have said, oh, you know what? For six months, there was this crazy thing where I got, you know, over here and I started the new uh, job and, you know, and I was driving a long way until I got an apartment. But, I, you know, because it's not a huge share of the population. But, uh, but there is a class of people who are doing a lot of driving, and that's what created that, that group. Okay, I, I think we're out of time. Is that right? Uh, I'll be around if you want to ask any more questions. I really appreciate you taking that. And sorry that my bottom line finding was a little, a little bit of a downer, but I, th I think it's really something to be aware of is what's happening with uh, a very large class of young people that are not really you guys and, and your experience. And I think it's important to, I think we want to get those urbanistas and those multimodalists up, but we don't want to, we want to get those stuck in places down. Thanks a lot. Thank you.